morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Fraunhofer. Welcome to the Plasma uh, user meeting from Hyden Analytical for 2023. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Um, so all thank you for coming. Your attendance is, is very much appreciated. Um, before I get started, um, a couple of notes on the agenda. So we have, we have the, you can, you've got a copy of the agenda on your desks. And um, we have some transport problems from the guys from IOM Leipzig. So Dr. Bundesmann's presentation will be now after lunch and we can cross our fingers that, that, that he attends by, by lunchtime. So the other presenters are going to shift upwards by one. So after Sam, we have Amir Abbas and um, then we have Dr. Kalfus after, after Amir. Uh, so yeah, good news wise, lunch is at 12 and midday um, and please don't pay for your lunch that's that's on us from Haydn okay so please enjoy your lunch and refreshments so I I'm Dr. Dane Walker I'm the marketing manager from Haydn Analytical um, and my colleague here is uh, Sam Bort as well as um, Andre Kaiser um, and and I'm sure you've met Andre before, as most of you have met Sam before as well. So I'm going to do a little introduction to Hyden Analytical. Um, as uh, I'm sure a lot of you have, have come into contact with us before, um, but I'll give you a, an insight into what other applications other than Plasma that we, that we address, as well as a bit about, about what we do. So Hayden has been in business for more than 40 years. So last year we had our 40 year anniversary. Um, and since that time, we've been privately owned. We're based in Warrington in the UK. Uh, we have the factory there in the sunshine with around 100, 100 staff that were privately owned. Um, we've been in business, like I say, uh, in the UK for around 40 years. We've got US subsidiary based in Michigan, which addresses the, the whole of the US. Um, and we have since 2019, we have Hyde in Europe based in Dusseldorf, um, which Andre Kaiser is the uh, sales manager for. Um, and we provide a local presence all around the world. So we have offices all around the world with, uh, with, with many staff and agents all around the world. Um, one thing that we do pride ourselves on is our customer support. Um, so we have lifetime email, telephone support uh, with, with all of our systems. So we're still, um, we're still providing support for systems that are up in excess of 30 years old. So our, our, main, um, our main business is mass spectrometers. That's probably 99% of what, of what, of what, we, what we manufacture. So our ranges can uh, contain gas analysis, um, dissolved species analyzers, uh, catalysts, catalysis and thermal analysis instruments. We have systems for thin films and surface engineering, as well as plasma, surface analysis and, and RGA systems as well, all based around uh, quadruple mass spectrometers. So for gas analysis, we, we, we're looking at measurement of uh, reactions from gas streams. So our new system here, we can see the QGA 2.0, and that was released two months ago here in, here in Germany. Um, and that's our next generation gas analyzer. That's a real time um, capillary sampling gas analyzer. We have dissolved species analyzers for um, looking at dissolved species in, in liquids and for electrochemistry. So we can look at real-time electrochemical act uh, reactions as well. Um, and we also have up to the, the, the huge HBR60 system, which has an integral uh, EQP plasma analyzer, which is a system for analysis of neutrals, radicals and ions, which you may have come into contact with. So we have a wide range of applications for gas analysis. Um, as, as you can see there, and, and we're really driven by the applications that we address. So for electrochemistry uh, and battery development, we have DEM systems, so differential electrochemical mass spectrometers, 
which look at the dissolved species uh, in real time electrochemical cells for battery development and, and things like that. Uh, we can also look at uh, environmental um, applications where we measure uh, radical uh, VOCs in seawater. Um, for mud logging as well, we, we have systems uh, for oil and gas. Um, we look at catalysts, we look at fuel cell reactions as well, all the way to real-time human breath analysis, where we're looking at low-level VOCs in, in breath analysis as well. For surface analysis, we have the TPD workstation, which is uh, temperature um, controlled desorption, temperature program desorption, where we're looking at samples such as uh, dissolved hydrogen in steels or deuterium in steels. Um, so we heat up the sample and then measure the species coming off with our, with our quadruple mass spectrometers. We have SIMs, so we have secondary iron mass spectrometry systems um, with integral iron, iron beams to locally analyze surfaces. Um, we work with iron beam matching systems, so we have iron milling probes as well. And we, we can look at, we have custom softwares for elemental imaging uh, and surface mapping. For plasma diagnostics, as you know, we have the EQP and we also have the HBR60, um, which is the molecular uh, beam mass spectrometer system, which is the atmospheric sampling or around atmospheric sampling um, plasma system. Um, and we can analyze neutrals and radical species using our um, plasma sampling mass spectrometers. We have more simple um, vacuum diagnostics with re residual gas analyzers. So these are bolted into process chambers. Um, we can look at um, low levels of contaminants. We can look at quality of um, the, the species inside the process chamber. Um, we can, we can um, do real-time monitoring. Um, we also have more high-performance systems for um, fusion systems such as the DLS-20, which is a 20 mil quadrupole, um, which can separate, for example, helium and deuterium. So again, there's some more application areas of industry that we, that we address. So we have biotechnology, oil and gas, semiconductor, aerospace, nuclear, solar industry for the SIMs, um, and obviously plasma coatings. In research, we have very, very similar again. We, we address a lot of different um, research avenues. So we have uh, electrochemistry is a, a huge one at the moment. We have materials analysis, space research, um, nuclear fusion, and, and biotechnology. So what, our key to our, our success as, as a company and, and how we like to work is that we, we address the application, we work with the end user, um, and, and we really, we have application specialists that are specialists in, um, in, in their avenues of research. Um, so we, we, do, we do try and understand the application uh, as well as we can to provide the, the correct solution for the, the end user. Um, so we, we are quite flexible in that we have a full design team, we have a full software team, so we can customize our products to, to address, um, address the end user's requirements, and we do that quite a lot. Um, some recent customers of ours, so we again, worldwide customers for semiconductors, aerospace, uh, and government research labs. Um, and, and then universities as well. So we, we, we're proud, of, proud to work with all these, with all these customers. Um, and, and we see that um, we, we, we're, we're working very closely with them. So this is us based in, this is our HQ in the UK um, with our contact details. And then I'll say a little bit about the team. We have Hyden Analytical Europe. 
So we have Andre Kaiser here, we have Sashin and Jürgen, and also, uh, and also Wolfgang, uh, and now my colleague Luke Wells. Um, so that's our team based in Germany. Um, so between them, they, they address the whole of Germany um, and Austria. So I'd like to pass over to Sam. And if there's any questions, um, please raise your hand while Sam gets, gets sorted. So Sam is one of our application specialists for plasma and a lot of you will know Sam from yeah. installations and, and, and trainings. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Dean. Hello, everyone. So, yeah, as the title says, I'd just like to talk briefly about some recent advancements that we've been making to the product line. I know some of you are probably already aware, but I just want to make sure everybody um, is up to speed. So, yeah. so the three things I want to talk about is multi-channel scalar mode, the EQP20, and dual zone um, operation. So before we start, I thought I'd show you one of our test chambers uh, back at the factory. So a lot of the data that I'm going to show you today was done uh, using this. Um, it's also used for testing all the new instruments that we ship out. And if you return any for maintenance, this is how it will be tested before we uh, ship it back to you. So it's a capacitively coupled um, plasma. The view through the window, um, you can see in the top corner. So the electrodes on the left, the EQPs on the right. Typically keep it about five to 10 uh, centimeters away. So 13.56 megahertz plasma, so we have the matching network. Um, and we can also pulse the plasma using the function generator so we can do time resolved um, studies as well. So the time resolved measurements, this is where you have a repeating event happening, usually multiple times per second. And what people want to measure is yeah, the time evolution of different plasma properties and um, so i just got an example from the literature there showing the three different plasma species and how they evolve over the course of a pulse so the the standard gating um, that all instruments are supplied with uh, it's a boxcar averaging technique so we supply the instrument with a synchronization signal at the plasma frequency and then we choose um, a window of time within the pulse where we can acquire the data and we can change the position and the width of the pulse uh, with the two parameters. It works really well, but it does have a weakness in that the narrower you make the acquisition window, the, the lower the effective duty cycle of the measurement is. So the instrument ends up scanning for a much shorter time, and it's just waiting uh, for much longer. So to get around this, we develop multi-channel scalar mode. So it's works in the same way with the synchronization signal, but instead of just a single acquisition window, we now have many, uh, up to around 6,000. We call them bins because we're emulating a multi-channel scalar card. So the main advantage of this is just the speed. The instrument's acquiring data for much bigger, larger proportion of the time. So we'll do that. So what this looks like is this is a comparison between the two. So this was done on that chamber. Um, 1.7 kilohertz pulse frequency, 150 microseconds uh, pulse duration. You can see the data is roughly the same, uh, but it's the acquisition time, so eight minutes versus nine seconds. And that's at quite a high uh, pulse frequency. If that was, say, 170 hertz, more like a high PIMS or something, then you know, 80 minutes versus 90 seconds. Suddenly a lot more uh, things become possible. So this is looking at a single energy, uh, but it's also possible to do the same scan, but for multiple energies, and then plot them in uh, three dimensions. So if we do that, that's what we get here. So we've got um, iron energy uh, down here and time um, going up there. And if we 
take slices in this direction after the, because it acquires the data this way. If we take the slices horizontally through here, we've acquired all of the iron energy distributions at the different points in time. So I think this one was a one microsecond resolution. And then after you've acquired the data, you can then um, extract the iron energies um, after the fact. So I just chose some where they look a little bit different for that. So the, the advantage is you can just get all the data, shut down the process, and then uh, get the iron energies um, afterwards. Yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about is the EQP20. So it's called the EQP20 because it's got 20 millimeter quadrupole rods. So the three um, EQP sort of members of the family are shown. So we've got the EQP6, the EQP9, and now the EQP20. So the advantage of going larger with the quadrupole is it improves the transmission through it. So that gives us a high, yeah, higher sensitivity. So in the table, um, the important one is the ratio. So at the low masses, it could be up to 16 times um, as sensitive as a nine millimeter. Um, and that advantage does drop off at higher masses, but it's up to five times the sensitivity. Uh, because it's larger and it's harder to drive, the mass range is slightly limited compared to the other one, so it's only a maximum of a thousand. Is a picture of one. So it's the same mounting arrangement, um, all the same, um, everything uh, down here is the same. So we can still do magnetic shielding, water cooling, driven electrodes, they're all the same. The only difference is the quadrupole section here, which is much larger. So, so sort of linked in with the EQP20 is the dual zone operation. So all of our other quadrupoles run in what we call zone one. Um, so this is a stability diagram. So normally it would be um, when you're sweeping the mass, you're increasing the RF and DC volts and hopefully just skimming the top of these stability regions to do that. But there is another stability region, uh, which we call zone H, which is at much higher uh, RF and DC volts. So the advantage of operating here is just greater resolving power. Um, but due to the very high voltage, that does limit the mass range. So it's only available to 0 to 20 AMU. So for that reason, we make it usable, uh, user switchable in software. So you can still do zone 1, 0 to 200. But then you get this high resolution mode, 0 to 20. Uh, we originally developed it for fusion research, uh, looking at sort of around mass 4 for helium and deuterium. And that's some example um, data that I got from the sales uh, stuff here. So the, the red line is zone one, where there is some separation, but it's not fantastic. But then green, as soon as we switch to zone H, it's much improved. And then it mostly replicates the same on the right hand side, but the um, this one here, which is the helium three isotope uh, with HD plus. That shows the maximum uh, resolving power we can get, which is 0 0.005. So as you go up in mass, um, it's not possible to do 0 0.005, but we can do this. So this was, again, done on that chamber, just using the residual water in the chamber and the argon uh, in the argon plasma. So there we can separate 0 0.028. AMU. So these will both be a nominal mass of sort of 18. Um, so then because it's an EQP, you can also do the iron energy distributions on those if you're expecting them to be different. Um, I chose to do the MCS on it. Um, so there is a difference there. So the two, the two ions do behave differently when it's a pulsed plasma. And without that resolving power, you wouldn't be able to separate those. It would be an average sort of of the two. So yeah. I think that, that covers it. I don't want to take much more uh, of your time. So I can answer any questions now or if you want to come and find me over lunch or whenever.
Yeah. Sure. There's one question I have right now. Yep. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Okay. Uh, my question is for the high resolution measurement, mm -hmm. then the, the distance from the EQT to the plasma source matters a lot. How near you have to go to the plasma source yep. to get decent high resolution in the nanometer range of the nanosecond range you showed? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's not something I've tried, but yeah, as you move further away, you would expect them to perhaps smear out slightly. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are uh, the options to, to, uh, to adjust the distance to vary the distance of the EQT to the uh, um, We could. If that was a, so we have a standard test routine. So we try and position the EQP when we're testing it uh, to send out to a customer in the same position so that we can use various measurements that we take as benchmarks to make sure it's performing properly. So that's the main function of that uh, chamber. But if, say, we had a special request um, to do that as part of the testing process, then yeah, we could fit a, a, Z, a Z translator to it and position it differently. We are still, in our case, are limited. We have our, our chambers, they have large size, and then we have mm -hmm. some one meter difference between the, the measuring device and yeah. the plasma source, and this is a lot. So you have light, light time effects, and this yeah. is your high resolution. Sure, so yeah. So that's where you would. Yeah. But also, a question Do you, did you cover some? Um, um, no, no. So it's it's running at quite a low power. This would be okay. sort of twenty watts, twenty to sixty watts, um, depending on what I do. And then when we're pulsing it, the duty cycle is quite low. So. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. Yes, so it's a, a sort of a stability region. So, um, yeah, so it's at a certain ratio of RF to DC volts and magnitude that will allow ions of a certain mass um, to pass through. So this is for both, uh, both of the yellow and the red are both for mass 20, I believe, yeah. Um, so you'll get transmission both in the red zone and uh, the yellow for that. It's just the magnitude of the RF and the DC that matters. So it's not like uh, the mass spectra is dependent on the mass spectrum? And sensitivity is different to different mass spectrum? Um, so that, if that is the case, then Yes, to compare between, if you wanted to do some measurements in zone H and some in zone 1, you would have to calibrate between the two. So perhaps do an RGA measurement with the internal ionization source, or perhaps with the plasma just in a steady state, make one measurement with uh, zone 1 and then one with zone H, and then you can work out the, the sort of the correction ratio between the two. But if you measure zone 1, although uh, there is no difference yeah, so you get the mass uh, mass dependent transmission. So the the transmission does fall off um, at the higher masses. So that's a well known um, thing. You can usually get a. Uh, I think we publish a, a rough table of that. And there's a relationship there for that. Yeah. The system already basic around this difference in um, Well, that would be something you would do um, afterwards. Yeah. Um, it, it only matters if you're doing uh, sort of quantitative measurements. If you're doing relative measurements, you know, the mass is sort of independent. You know, the, the signal level doubled when we did this. Uh, you don't have to take it into account. Uh, yeah. 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 No. yeah. Can you just talk a little bit more about the, the test plasma that you, that you use and, and why that's maybe a little bit different to what customers would use in a, when, when you go on site? Um, 
well, we're just, it's designed for testing instruments. So we just want it to be um, stable, reliable, the same every time we put it on. Uh, we don't want to be sputtering anything or coating anything um, because it has to be sent out clean to the, to the customer. So we, we try and limit what gases we put in. That's why for that zone H stuff, it was just water in the argon. I don't want to go put in ammonia in or something like that. So, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Okay, well, thanks. Brent, no worries. Uh, I'll let you do that. You feel better at driving. <laughs> okay. So now we have um, me. Let me try to change the. Yeah, please, yes. Can you just place this microphone on your on your shirt? Is that okay? <clears throat> hey, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Amir Apostol Tagari. I'm doing my master thesis in Fraunhofer IPMS. Uh, Matthias Radol, Abhishek Batsal, and uh, Jennifer Cannon helped me in this regard. And uh, uh, the title of this presentation is Plasma Diagnostic of uh, Radio Frequency Excitation on Industrial Door Frequency Capacitive Coupled Plasma Etching Tool using quadrupole mass spectrometry. Uh, here you can see the outline of this presentation. I start with motivation, experimental setup, I speak about the tool and the plasma diagnostic tool. I go to methods, idea of summation, measurements, error, and conclusion. Let's start with motivation. Okay, to aid the development of process uh, for back end of line and interlayer dielectric, uh, and due to the increase in material limitation and technical difficulties due to device uh, miniaturization, uh, we face problems such as uh, edge uniformity, critical dimension control, edge selectivity, edge profile expansion, charge accumulation, edge damage, and pattern distortion. Here you can see a photo, an illustration, showing the uh, interlayer dielectric. Here is the copper line, and this is the dielectric, and here is the front, of line, uh, front end of line. Uh, yeah, and this is a trade-off triangle, showing that the ion flux, radical flux, ion energy, radon, uh, uh, Radical flux and byproducts effect on uh, profile, selectivity, and aspect ratio dependence edge. So it's good to uh, be able to control the radical flux and ion energy. So here there are two ways that uh, can help in this regard, uh, dual frequency CCP and pulse plasma. And because of the lack of knowledge about the plasma condition, I did plasma diagnostic. I start with uh, argon plasma because it's simple and it doesn't degrade the tool itself. And uh, I did some higher frequency and lower frequency uh, variations. And I uh, did experiments on pulse plasma mode. And the advantages is it's in situ methods non-destructive and real-time methods. And it gives us insight on ion per radical ratio and control over ion flux and ion energy. So 
So now the experimental setup. So here is the schematic of the dual frequency CCP a chamber with plasma diagnostic systems. I use a Tel Vigus LK3 chamber. It has two radio frequency generator, one in lower frequency and the other is higher frequency at 12.88 megahertz and 14.68. So I call this one LF from now on and this one HF. The QMS from Hayden Analytical EQP500 is connected to the chamber wall in the wafer level and other diagnostic tool, uh, high resolution OES and SEARS from Plasmatrix is also available. <coughs> so here I speak about the Hayden EQP500 plasma diagnostic tool. Uh, Hayden EQP500 mass spectrometer with energy analyzer. It can go to mass from range of 0 to 500 AMU. Mass spectra of neutral and ions. Energy spectra of ions. RGA mode for neutrals and SIMS mode for ions. Yes. So I mostly work with IDFs for in SIMS plus mode, uh, IDF shows how energetic active ions in plasma are, a snapshot of ion bombardments, energy being transferred to surface. Uh, ion flux generated inside plasma is product of the integral intensity under the plot. So this is the IDF and the integral intensity under this plot is ion flux. The IDF is mainly influenced by uh, the transit time and ion uh, take to cross the sheet and by collisions the ion experience in the sheet region. And IDF depends on the following parameters, RF power, RF frequency, and chamber pressure. So here you can see a mass scan and an energy scan using the QMS tool. Now we go to methods. Dual frequency CCP, it can generate continuous wave plasma and pulsed plasma. This is a chamber, LF power and HF power, different decay time constant for uh, ions, radicals and uh, Electrons is different when the uh, plasma is off. So uh, this helps us with uh, etching profile. So in continuous wave, you will you see the etching profile is different because uh, of the opening here. But in pulse mode, because of the control over the ion per radical ratio, you will see this etching profile. So this is a design of experiment for continuous wave plasma. <coughs> I did pressure variation in, the, in this pressures, 30 millitor to 100 millitor. Power variation for HF power 0 to 300 and LF power from, from 0 to 300. And I did a spotter rates for all these experiments. Here is a snapshot of argon plasma mass scan. We will focus on argon plus and argon argon plus. Argon argon plus uh, gives us the ion energy because if uh, inter goes into any collision inside the, uh, its way to the uh, orifice, it uh, disappears. So if we see argon 2 plus, it uh, shows us the ion energy. And here is the process power variation. So I start with HF0 and LF variation and other powers. 
Okay, here is the spot arrays for all continuous wave. Uh, here you, you see the effect of LF power, HF power at pressure 30 millitor. How is the spot array different at different pressure? So I start with pressure. Why at different pressure the spot arrays are different? This is the IDF for argon plus 300 HF 300 LF. You see when the pressure is increasing, the IDF integral intensity and peak energy decreases. So in LF case, when the pressure increasing, the inter integral intensity at higher ion energy decreases and the integral intensity at lower ion energy increases. And in HF case, the integral intensity decreases and the peak shifted to the lower energies. So as the pressure is increasing, the average energy and the integral intensity decreases. So pressure mainly influences the ion collisions in the sheet region. And that's why we see this is butter rates. But when I check the VPP from the tool, uh, I noticed uh, these two plots. So what is VPP? The amplitude of the radio frequency voltage applied to the plasma. So when we change the power, this is the amplitude. And the difference in voltage between the maximum positive and maximum negative peaks within one cycle of the waveform. So when we change the pressure for RF power at higher frequency, we don't see any change in upper VPP. But when we change the pressure for uh, lower RF power, we saw differences in VPP. So it is a tool it adjusts itself when we change the pressure. So to see the real pressure effect, we run an experiment with constant VPP. So this is the before, constant power, 300. And here is constant VPP. So here you see the real pressure effect, just decreasing in integral intensity. And the energies are constant. Now I speak about the power effect, the LF power effect and HF power effect. Here is uh, the effect of LF power only. So the HF power is off here. When we go from LF power from 100 watt to 300 watt, we see an increase in ion energies. So the uh, ion energies increase in higher range. And also the argon 2 plus shows the increase in ion energies. This is the HF only. So the LF power is off and we only increase the power for HF frequency. And you see the increase in integral intensity and also uh, it, uh, increase in ion energies. And this is the effect of both LF power and HF power. So you see an increase in this direction. <coughs> yes. Why we see two peaks in our IDFs? So the lower energy peak corresponds to the influence of the minimum sheet voltage, whereas the higher, for, higher energy peak is caused by the maximum sheet voltage. And why we see these differences in the width of the peaks. At lower frequency, the ion transit time is almost uh, equal to RF cycle. So we see more separated peak. And at higher frequency, the ion transit time is much higher than RF cycle. So the peaks are more unified. And ion respond to average sheet potential. And this is the influence of power on VPP. 
So when we change the HF power and LF power, the upper VVP just uh, uh, influenced by HF power and the lower VPP is influenced by both of the HF power and LF power. And this is the conclusion for continuous wave. You see the uh, HF power and LF power influence on ion flux. So ion flux is mostly influenced by HF power. And you see the HF BPP, which is the product of HF power. And you see it only corresponds to higher frequency. And the lower frequency uh, caused having higher ion energies. So when the LF power is increasing, the ion energy is increasing. And you see this effect better in LF VPP. And here is the ion flux, ion energy, and a sputter rate. So you see the sputter rate is depend on ion energy and ion flux both of them together and by combining the idfs with uh, a sputter rates we see the sputter threshold this is my experiments and these are the literatures so for the case of both lf power and hf power on we get 25 EV as a sputter threshold, and it's almost close to the literatures. And in the case of LF only and HF only, this is the sputter threshold. So far, I have speak about uh, continuous wave plasma. Now I'm going to talk about the pulsed plasma. So the tool can generate a pulsing mode for LF power and or HF power or pulsing both the RF at synchronized way and with different frequency and duty cycle. So in pulsing mode, I speak about pulsing mode versus pressure, frequency, duty cycle, ion energy and ion flux comparisons and sputter rate comparisons. The RF power for continuous wave kept at 300 HF and LF, 300 watt. I did pressure variation at uh, frequency and duty cycle. So here is the influence of pressure on pulsing mode. In case of LF pulse, HF pulse, and sync pulse, for all of them, when we increase the pressure, the intensity at higher ion energy range decreases and the intensity in the lower energy range increases for all of the pulsing mode this is the same this is the influence of frequency on different pulsing modes so in case of lf pulse as the frequency increases from 0.1 kHz to 10 kHz, the integral intensity almost remains constant. <clears throat> in case of HF pulsing, the frequency increasing impact on lower integral intensity. And in case of sync pulsing, the, the frequency increasing impact on higher integral intensity. So the IDFs are here. And this is the influence of duty cycle on pulsing modes. As the duty cycle increases in LF pulse, the higher energy range, integral intensity increases, and in the lower energy range, it decreases. But in case of HF pulsing, the integral intensity of the whole IDF increases. And in case of sync pulsing, the in integral intensity increases, and the Lower energy range is not available. So here is different pulsing modes. Ion flux, ion energy, 
of different passing modes for different duty cycle. So as we increase the duty cycle to the continuous wave, we see HF pulsing as decreases in ion energy, LF pulsing, ion energy increases when we go to higher duty cycles and the sink pulsing decreases. And this is for different pressures. And this is the effect of duty cycle on ion flux. So the LF pulse has decreased in ion flux, HF pulse increase and sink pulse also increase. This is the effect of frequency on ion energy and ion flux for HF pulse and LF pulse. As the frequency increases, the ion energy almost remains constant and ion flux almost remains constant. So the frequency doesn't have so much effect on the ion energy and ion flux in different pulsing modes for argon plasma. And this is the duty cycle effect on a spotter rate. So when the duty cycle increases, the spotter rate increases for different pressure, for HF pulse, LF pulse, and sink pulse. And this is the uh, frequency effect on a spotter rate. So you see also the frequency doesn't have so much effect on <clears throat> this is the spotter threshold for different pulsing modes. So you see the spotter threshold in pulsing modes is a mix of uh, different duty cycle and pulsing modes with both power on. Thus we see so much difference and so much spread here. And this is the comparisons with continuous wave. So in LF pulse, we see this energy for a spotter threshold for HF pulse and sink pulse, and this is versus continuous wave. So now we go to IEDF summation. This is the idea for LF pulsing 300 HF, 300 LF at duty cycle 50 DC. And these two are the two continuous wave plasmas. One is HF only, and the other is both powers on. And this is the resulting IEDF with duty cycle 50, which is almost the same IEDF as LF pulsing. So, the summation of two IDF, two co continuous wave experiments can be simulated with single pulse plasma run, keeping the desired IDF shape from both. And it helps on recipe selection. So in case of summing both IDF and pulsing mode, this is the shape of the pulse. And this is here I speak about measurement errors. So the starting time of the IDF measurement after four minutes, after 10 minutes and 15 minutes gave me different IDFs. So I always start the measurement at uh, same time. And this is the IDF versus QMS position. So QMS is uh, located uh, on the chamber wall, but it's not always connected to the chamber and it's uh, located on a Z shift. So whenever we want to use the QMS, we connect the QMS. So here you see when it's two millimeter more inside or two millimeter outside, this is the resulting idea. And always the QMS position kept the same. And here is the chamber environment. So we always run a same recipe and whenever we see any changes in the IDF, we do chamber cleaning and chamber environment cleaning, yeah. And 
reach the conclusion. So pressure has major effect influence in ion collisions in the sheet region for continuous wave. And continuous wave mainly, uh, in continuous wave, higher frequency governs ion flux and ion energy influenced by lower frequency. So this is the main conclusion for continuous wave mode. In the pulsed mode, pressure increase causes shift to intensity from higher to lower ion energy in pulsing mode and frequency has only a slight influence on duty cycle. And duty cycle has the major influence in pulsing mode. And from the spatter rates, I came to this conclusion that the spatter rates highly dependent on pressure and LF power and weakly dependent on HF power. Also, these a spatter rate is codependent on ion flux and ion energy. A spatter threshold slightly varies between each position, each pulsing mode. A spatter rate is high, uh, highest when both RF powers on, and with increasing duty cycle, a spatter rate increases. And this increase is sharp, sharper at lower pressure. Thank you for your attention. Okay. okay, so we have time for a few questions. If you have any questions. Yes. What is the reason for this change in energy distribution with time? With time. Yeah. Uh, it can be uh, because of the tool itself. So the plasma condition can uh, change over time, or it can be because of the QMS itself. It can be a problem with uh, like um, the extraction of plate like as a capacitor, and the, the it doesn't give the voltage that we set exactly in a time. So the IDF might varies over the time. That's why we kept the uh, Measurement at start time, the same. Yeah. Thank you for the nice presentation. Thank you. It was very interesting. And one question I have. How do you measure the etching rate in your, in your station? Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, run a test for one minute etching uh, uh, silicon oxide, thermal oxide. And after one minute, I use ellipsometer to uh, see the edge rates. And the question adding to this is do you also measure the silicon? You have some, some neutral silicon in the, in the plasma, I assume, and you should measure it or could measure it too and have some uh, direct measuring of the, of the uh, etching rate, maybe one or two moles. I, I didn't understand the question. Yes, okay. Yes. Have you measured silicon in your in the plasma? Maybe not so uh -huh. ions, but neutral? Uh, in mass scans, you mean? Uh, yeah, we saw traces of silicons uh, in uh, when we started the process for mass scan. There was some traces of silicon also after etching. Yes. Is it very low rate that you uh, the X-ray, or is the amount? Uh, no, I didn't do that. Is there any more questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have uh, Frank can help us from, from here. So then, hello also from, from my side. 
We are from Friend of IWS. This is where you are right now. We are hosting this event or together with, with Haydn. They came to us, I think it was last year already, and then we talked about, or we asked, are there some, some meetings to discuss with other applicants of the devices, how they measure what the what new developments are and measuring strategy. I think this is the most important if you start measuring with the, with the EQP as we did. And so we have to discuss a lot. And so the, the lifetime support by email, uh, phone calls and so on is very important. Then first you have to get this running and then the measuring is done within a few days, but get it running then you need for years maybe. But if you have some help and know the people you can talk to, then this is of course a great thing. This is the one I have to click on. I also want to introduce you to, to Fraunhofer and the Fraunhofer Society. I think this is the, the name giver of our, of our institution. We have some very many employees right now. I think there's are above 30,000 in Europe and or in Germany and, and Europe also. And we have some branches in, in, the US, in the US and other countries of the world too. And the concept of Fraunhofer is important, not only here, it's some role model also for other countries. They, they visit us and want to do something like this also in, in their countries. And why is this? This is the combination of the, the research we do anyway, the, the uh, invention of new things. And the very important point is as Fraunhofer itself did, he was also had a, a factory and has had to earn money with his ideas. So we want to combine all of it, all of it and do some applied research and directly for the industry or, or very near to industry needs. And so they can make money out of our ideas or the things we develop together if they, they ask us for do so. This is what we are doing. This is the number I came up with earlier or the last slide. Uh, many, many people. The staff is including students also and full-time employees. Maybe there are 22,000 or so. And some, many people that we do, we don't are allowed to give doctoral degrees, of course, but we are connected this strong to universities all over Germany so that we always have professors working at the institute as a head of the institute or, or leading some technology units. And so we are strongly connected. And so this is something we, we do uh, typically all the time. These are, I think, 76 institutes and research units right now. Maybe since the presentation was made, it's, it's changed a little, but this is, is the range. And uh, 3 billion euros financial volume. This is a lot, of course. And what we, what we see on the right side, it's the, the basic funding we get anyway. The 30%, and the other things we have to do industrial contracts or do public funded projects for, for this money. So we have to, to write proposals, of course, uh, develop new ideas, find partners to develop it, uh, discuss with the industry, discuss also in, in this uh, meetings as we do today, find new ideas. What do we have to develop next? What's the next big thing? And of course, we have to be ahead of new topics that we are, or we can involve ourselves in the development of this. So the Fraunhofer IWS is also, is not a large institute within Fraunhofer, but we have some 320 people here. And these are only full-time employees and 450 with students and, and part-time, uh, also assistants, name it like this. And we are doing, it's front of the IPS. It's named for uh, material and beam technology. With beam, this is mean laser. We don't develop lasers, but we do all kind of laser processing technologies all around what you have. A test uh, for, for cutting, for, for joining, and for structuring surfaces. It's important for, for many, many applications. And of course, we also do, this is what I do, we do also coatings, also different kind of coatings. We do some, we have the uh, generative 
uh, technology we are using also to 3D printing of ultra-large scale devices for some space applications. And also this is a whole range we are working in. And the material is one of our base components to understand what the material does, what it can, how it can improve. This is our topic here at, at the IWS. So what do we have next? Now we have the outline of, of my talk. I changed the name a little. It's now only industrial scale carbon coatings with laser arc technology. We don't have to look at, at the applications because we are a user seminar and we are want to look at what can we do with plasma measurements, what are the, the problems we have to, to achieve that. And so I put this more in the focus and also to prepare you for our lab tour later than at, at 2 p.m. So you already know how it's working, so we can then focus on the, on the measuring technique and the results we see there. Okay, also the laser arc technology is our base technology for doing carbon coatings. Then I tell you something about EQP measurement requirements in our case and the results to it. And of course, a summary at the end. So if you hear carbon and carbon coatings, a name maybe you have heard a lot is DLC. It's some overall name describing all kinds of carbon coatings, and they can range in a, in a really wide range from graphite to diamond and describes nearly everything when it's a coating, because the C in it's clear, then it's a coating. But it's, it's very different what it can mean. In our case, we can't do diamonds. We still have in our coding technique, we are generating amorphous coatings. And so we are out of the, the right side with diamond and nanocrystalline diamond, but we can achieve the, the coatings here named AC and, and TAC. Now the, the picture is missing. And it's in the range SP3 content from 20 up to, to 80. This is one advantage of our technology we can uh, can get these kind of, of hard coatings. This is special about the technology and also in very high rates. And of course, we are hydrogen free or nearly hydrogen free. So we, we don't have it in the chamber. Maybe if there is some leakage or so, then we have some very small amounts in it, but no hydrogen in the coatings at all. And so at the end, we got very hard coatings. Well, maybe now you, you it's back again the AC and TAC, you see the different bonding types, the, the, the darker ones are the SP3 ones and the bright ones are SP2, the graphite-like bondings. Uh, carbon is a very great material in this case also for doing coatings, but what we did in the last time, we add additional elements. We, we doped our carbon and so we can change Anything, there but just one L too much <laughs> there, uh, can add additional functions and modify the electrochemical and mechanical uh, properties of the films by adding small amount of, of other elements in it, in the low percentage range. And of course, in this case, we have a plasma containing carbon and additional elements. And so it's more difficult to measure this. Instead of only measuring carbon, we have to also look at other elements. And the heavier they are, the different, uh, the difficulter it gets to measure it. So now let me introduce you to the laser arc technology. It's called uh, LAM, LAM. For the and the M stands for modulus. This was an additional idea, uh, an initial idea to make it uh, adaptable to any coding chamber or at nearly any coding chamber. This is what you see on the left. We have some graphite cathode material, and this is what we want to evaporate. And we are working with some pulsed laser. This is the, the first picture in the left. For the ignition, it's some, some short pulse laser, 100 nanoseconds to generate some initial plasma. And then we start our an, an arc, an arc discharge with some high current for, in this case here, 1.6 kilo amps is some, some usual number we are using. And then we have some spot splitting as also it's described in literature a lot. 
and it's more difficult on on carbon because we don't have a, a fast movement of the cathode spots on the on the surface of the graphite. So we have to uh, stop this process after some some milliseconds or some microseconds in this case. Uh, wait wait a little, or there is some time in between, and then we reignite it at another at a different position. And if we scan very fast, we have some linear carbon source after all. What are the advantages of our technology? We don't need uh, magnetic fields for control of the arc spot. Otherwise, if you use DC arc, you have some magnetic field generator or some magnets on the backside, maybe adjustable also to get a good utilization of your, of your cathode. And in our case, we don't need this anymore. And as you see on the right side, we have some new and some end of life uh, graphite cathode and we can utilize nearly all of the material because we can scan and we do uh, use all in, in areas of the, of the cathode is this, the, the same. Uh, this high volume targets also leads us to longer coding processes and very thick coatings. We can do 20, 30 micrometer thick hard coatings for, for several applications where it's needed. And of course, you can use thinner ones also. Then the targets you, you need is only then, in this case, one for a week or so, depending on, on the, how much you use your coder and how thick the films are. Okay, the combination with other PVD, uh, PVD equipment is, is possible without a problem, but mostly people come to us and ask for a, a designated batch coder, and then we work with partners together to, to make this working for them. And what we also have, which is important, as you know always, if you have arc coatings, then you have the problem with the droplets in case of metal films or, or nitrides, oxides, and so on. And in our case, we have no, there is no solid graphite. It's then, in this case, then these are particles. And so we have particles in our films. And if we do filtering, if you have plasma anyway, we can use magnetic fields to bend the plasma, as you see on the right uh, picture in the bottom. Then we can do plasma filtering and get smoother coatings. This is how it looks like, the two types of, of our coding machines and plasma modules. On the left side, you have some high deposition rate variant uh, up to two micrometers an hour. Mostly we are limited then by the temperature we put in, in the chamber. Uh, if you want to grow carbon, you need to stay at lower temperatures below 100 degrees C. And the higher you get in temperature, the, the softer your films get. That means at 180 degrees C, you don't get any SP3 coatings anymore. And then you have to cool your sample holder or have to reduce the deposition rate. So we are, could be limited also by, by this. We have some droplets or particles, of course, in the films. This is what we expect. And so it's mostly necessary to do some uh, post treatment of the surfaces. If there are like, like piston rings, they are very easy to, uh, to process and also easy to, uh, to grind afterwards so that it's some standard process. And of course, there are applications when you are not able to grind anything or, or adjust the surface after coating anymore. If you think about gears, then you need initial smooth coatings to make this working. And on the right side, we have some scheme of such a particle filter. And as you see, the plasma is generated at the graphite. Then the particles are flying straight in some, some structure and only the pure plasma is going to the deposition chamber. And so we get smoother coatings. But also, of course, if you have a filter, then you always have some reduction in deposition rate. And so we have 50%, which is good, but we still have particles in there. And in this case, then up to one micrometers per hour for a full loaded chamber. This is our our equipment we have, uh, one of our machines, and then you can also see our problem. We have some basic plant put in, in this case, the, it's not the, the it's schematic is not in the right 
scale, of course. Then we have on the left side one module with filtering, on the right side one module without filtering, and so we can combine our coatings. But what we can't do anymore in this case, as you see, we can't adjust or adapt our, our plasma monitor anymore because all the flanges are adapted with some plasma sources already, and so in this case we can't measure at all. This is one problem we, we had, and we had to overcome this, and how we did this I'll show you later. And of course, uh, special doped coatings we can also put in through the filter, also we can uh, uh, evaporate and see also differences by the filtering because our filter is usually iron energy selective and so there are also effects if we evaporate doped cathodes in the system. And on the other hand we can do all on the right side all kind of coatings and what we also did is MOS2 coatings which are working very well and we got a much better adhesion at the spotted films they are available on the market and maybe there are an option for applications, but it's a complicated process for this. And I don't know if someone in the industry wants to do this, uh, except there is this uh, advantage of these kind of films that it's making the, the cost uh, valuable. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is some presentation, some, some video of our process, of our principle. This was the, the LAR modulus attached to the, to the cathode, uh, to, the, to the chamber. Then you here now see the, the scanning laser and the arc spots on the cathode surface. This process is very fast. It's uh, 300 hertz, no, uh, 150 hertz each, each uh, cathode. And so at all you got some You get some some linear carbon source. So now we can also go to the street. And here you see now the plasma and of course PVD or laser arc as PVD technique, it's line of sight. That means we always have to rotate our, our samples to make it coated all around. Okay, the EQP measurement requirements, as I told you before, we have to look straight in our plasma source. And we did some, some changes anyway. We developed some new, some new filter with some 90 degree C uh, deflection. And so we had a chance. In this case here you see our, this is the, the standard laser arc module as I showed you before. And now we want to bend our plasma to the, to the main chamber, which is shown here. And, but now we have all the options to look inside the plasma straight from the other side. We adjusted flanges to the side in the, in the beginning because we know we want to measure it. But we can also do measuring from this side. There are also flanges attached in this. So we can measure the plasma straight and also the bended plasma by 90 degrees. But we haven't done the, this measuring already. We only at, at adopted the, the device in here, and so we can do all the developments uh, need for that. And here this is, is the scale, how it looks like, and our thinking is bend the plasma and avoid particles being reflected and coming back to the, or coming inside the, the main chamber. We are very flexible by our arc discharge, and we heard about some, some low uh, power sputtering processes before. And of course, we have some much higher powers. We have some 1,600 amps, for example, at, at 80 volts or so. That means we got a lot of power in the system. And so also, if we do the measure, measurements later with the EQP, we have to reduce the frequency. Otherwise, we, we heat it up. And so we can't measure only for, for a short time. This is something we have to think about always. It's many different aspects we have to think about if you want to get some decent measurements out of it. Different kinds of, of pulse forms we can adjust. Also to think about, we want to adjust the plasma exactly as we want. And of course, then we expect differences 
between some short pulse with some high current, as you see here. This is our more or less our standard. It's now a rectangle name, but it's uh, scene shaped also a little. And the other one is, uh, the thinking about this was uh, uh, reduce the current by the half and then make it twice as long. But in our case, I only show the results of, of this, what we have as uh, plasma properties out of this uh, uh, pulse form. We have, as I showed you, short pulses here, the 300 microseconds also, but long breaks in between. And if you want to tune the device, you have to, to gate the measurements Every, as always, otherwise you don't get a, a signal. The system can't work with some, some time where no ions coming in, then it's for some reason, maybe it's the old software, maybe it's a principle, it's not possible to tune. You always have to gate. This is something we, we put in and we use some, some gating with some delay and then some measure, measuring window. And we also look what do we expect in what uh, window. This is also some very important thing for us. But after all, it's, it's essential for us to, to gate the measurements. This is one measurement of the, of the current itself inside the chamber. This is the exact arc current I showed you before on the slide. It's starting with time zero. And then we have some sample holder here in the, in the, in the chamber after bending of the plasma, of course, 90 degree. And then we have some, some iron current. You see the different scale over here. And so we have some, some time of light effect, of course, some at least uh, 50 microseconds the, the plasma needs from the starting point to the, to the substrate. And of course, the substrate is always uh, put in with some 100 volts bias voltage to avoid electrons coming in. And here, this is some effect you always see First are the electrons, and then you have some, some small peak also. But the shape is, is nearly the same, and so this is what, what we expect. So now let's come to the EQP results. To remember, this is our plasma source here, our, our base chamber, and this is the place we are starting the measuring. And we did some no plasma redirection measurements in the beginning. And this is the, the graph of it here in the energy in electron volts. This is always easy possible if it's some, some single charged ions. Then you have to not uh, think about voltage or electron volts. The count rates are good, of course. And we, I added this at 100% or, or put this to 100%. And then we did the plasma redirection active. And so we have some reduction of the, of the surface under the, uh, the plasma flux then itself. And then we have some uh, 55, uh, 35 percent uh, rest of, of plasma or plasma flux to the, to the EQP. And we also measure this for a total different process at a different time. The, the deposition rate at one sample here and one sample here, same, more or less same distance. And we see some, I name it similar, it's maybe it's 55 and 65.3. It, it's not this accurate, of course, we don't expect it, but we have the, the same range. We have 0.9 micrometer film thickness in the sample here and 1.4 in the, sem, uh, the sample here. That means we got a, a plasma transmission over 50% with our 90 degree filter, which is better than the 60 degree one I showed you before. And I think there are additional options to, to increase this in the, in the future also. The next thing I want to show you, I started this in the beginning, is the multi-material evaporation. And so we put in different materials. In this case, we, we used some, some metals and non-metals in forms from boron and molybdenum. They are two, two, two examples. Boron as a non-metal, very light element, and molybdenum as a very heavy metal for, for different kind of applications. We had some thinking about in the beginning, why use boron? Boron doesn't affect the sp3, sp2 ratio this much because it wants to form sp3 bondings anyway. 
So it stabilizes and then molybdenum, the thinking behind this was to make it um, or to adapt it to applications where you need lubricants with some molybdenum in it. And it forms some, some uh, dry sliding components, molybdenum disulfide in the, on, the, on the surface. And this was one of the thinking why we use the molybdenum. And the differences between you can see here in the cross sections in the beginning, we have PAC with really rough coatings and we have defect structures in the, in the TAC coatings. In this case, there are thick five micrometers. And if you do some break, then you see this structure. And if you go to TACB, we have the same hardness, means same, same SP3 ratio. And here we have some very smooth film without any defects anymore. And if you look to the molybdenum one, then you see also a smooth surface and you see nothing as defects in it anymore. And two differences at the, at the selected area refraction you see up here in these pictures, you see amorphous, also carbon TSC is amorphous always. The TSCB stays amorphous and at AC molybdenum, it's some, some graphitic nanostructure we see being there. And this also, we can also use this kind of structure for several applications, but I come to this later. But here we have of, at all some effect of the heavy molybdenum and some results of this I show you at the next slides now. First, we did some initial measurements of our graphite electrode, a cathode, which we evaporated with the process at, with the, the pulse form I showed you before, the 1600 amps and rectangle pulse. And here we have now the, the ion energy in electron volts. It, this is correct. And for the C plus and C2 plus, and of course you, we know we have many, many uh, parts of it in, in C plus and only a little C2 plus. And there are also effects, also thermal effects of our graphite cathode. That means if the cathode is very cold, in the beginning we got some, some large, larger amount of, of C2 plus, but it's get, if it's getting hotter and hotter, then it gets less and less. And so we always did some initial running in of the cathode so that they gain temperature and measured after this always. And the average ion energies, this is some value we know from the literature also, and it's around the 30 EV for the single charged ions. Now this scale is now changed to voltage. And if you want to go to the electron volts, you have to multiply this with, with, the, with the ion state. This is uh, two times ionized, so it's moving to the right side, of course. And for boron, it's the same. And if we compare this now to each other, the, the boron and the carbon, we see it's, it's very similar. And it's also in the range for the two times charges and the, and the single charged ions. And so we, this is something we, we see also if we use a plasma filter, we have the same concentration of, or the same relation between carbon and boron in the film, independent or, the, or the, also if we do filtering or no filtering, it's always the same because they are in a similar energy range. And so it's, they are filtered the same. Now, if we go to the molybdenum one, it's only five atomic percent in it, which is, is not much, but it has a huge effect. And here we see some movement to the right side and some very large area or ion flux in the, in the carbon plus. Here it's voltage. That means you have to scale this, of course, multiply by two. And if we go to the, to the left side, then we, of course, you have to do some measurement at each uh, 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 charge state of each element. Then you have to do the, the scan or set up one scan where you do all this at a, at a time. And here, if you have the voltage, this, you have to multiply this by, by the charge time. The blue one stays the same and the other ones are going far and far to the higher ion energies. And if we are now at the, at the four plus, we are maybe at 200 electron volts, which is some very high energy of the molybdenum. And of course, it's also heavy and this has some large effect of, on our carbon coatings, of course. What we see, also what we expect from the literature, 
we have some two times charge, three times charge. This is the, the dominant species as we expected also from, from other uh, scientists. Okay, now I put it together also always the, the C plus for the three different cathodes. All the other process is the same. And we see now the reference in carbon. And then we see some movement to, to higher iron energy, so some higher iron energies if you put boron in it. And if you put molybdenum in it, then it moves straight to the, to the right side. And of course, we affect our, our properties of our films with it. How we do this, I haven't brought you here. I think this would be too much, but we can use this device very well for our measurements. And of course, if we go then to time resolution, then there are other, other questions we have, and it's still difficult to measure, but we are doing it, or we, I, I like to do it very much. And this brings me to the summary. Laser arc et al. is a technique for industrial scale carbon coatings and the machines are sold or running in industry at several, several sites. And the new customized TSC coatings allow new applications or many new applications. We have some interests in this already and we want to understand or better understand the evaporation of these kind of materials and utilize this knowledge also in preparing the coatings for all kind of applications. So this brings me to the end. Thank you and I'm happy to answer questions. I think I used the time very well so we can do seven minutes talking and then go for lunch. I don't know if this is a question or I, I can answer. Oh, yeah. mm, yeah. I, I know. Okay, yeah. So we, we, we can um, have a specialized version which can be up to 1100 electron volts. Um, so if we have a high, high current there, then, then, then that, 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 that works okay. Um, where it, it biases the whole instrument. Up to up to the higher voltage, so it can deal with higher um, higher high current as well. Um, so the energy filter is um, is able to be driven externally as well as that, as well as internally up to eleven hundred volts. Mm. So generally, that's okay for higher energy plasma systems. But the so thing you you. Is your question answered? I think I, I know what you mean. You have electrons also coming to the to the nozzle of the device, also electrons and ions, and then of course you heat up the the whole system with the electrons, changing temperature and reducing accuracy of the of the device, and maybe doing some some setup where we extract the electrons before and you have some some plate with some hole in it yes. to reduce the the electron. Yeah. rate to the to, to your system mm -hmm. so we can the system can be supplied with um actively cooled an actively cooled shroud so on the front end of the system it can be actively cooled so it can be kept at a constant temperature mm -hmm. um also we can have um we can have some deflection there as, uh, as well to deflect preferentially with the electrons so inside we have uh, we have lenses at the front which can be set to repel electrons uh, as they come to the front of the system as well. So the the, the structure of the, the lenses is all is all tubal, so you can mm -hmm. deflect the species before they even get further down into the system. Um, and by by the time they've gone through the extraction system um, and through the energy spectroanalyzer, um, then then yeah, they can be. 
community or, or be repelled before they interact with any of the species, mm. either internally or, or externally mm. from the system. Mm. Yeah, there's a few, there's always there's a few options. Mm. A few options so. And and does the device have to operate it grounded, or can you also put it on some little negative potential? I think we only need some some ten watts or so. Yeah, so it can be it can be floated externally. The whole device can be, mm -hmm. can be floated. So normally it's grounded to the okay, chamber, and, but mm -hmm. it can be it can be floated and isolated um, externally as well. So um, some users are floating to maybe three or four kilovolts to uh, to match their, their their plasma conditions. So this is that's also that's also possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is low. It's only 1%, not 10% as we expect. It's, it's low, yes. And we know we have to do some adjustments to increase the, 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 the coding rate, also for the sample standing in front. That means also in this case, the, the current is very low. It's by the way we operated with the two circuit system and using only the, the anode for the, for the arc current, not the chamber anymore. And so we have this bad effect. And we saw it also some years ago when we tested it, this setup once. It's, it's really bad. And we have to adjust this where we have the, the, the electron sink. In, in the chamber. This is the thing we want to look at next. But yes, it's too low. And of course, I can say something about uh, the angle we are using, and we have some small sample, but it's, it's still low. I'm just curious, how do you bend the plasma at the angle? With some, some coil, magnetically. The, the coil is, is covered, so there are no coatings on the, on the coil. No, it's, it's, it's purely magnetical bended, then you have some high flux in the middle of your coil, and this is bended by 90 degree. It's some Xenov principle filter type which is well developed and used for, for at several uh, coatings, nanofilms they are building, machines with some double 90 degree filters to achieve very smooth coatings. And we want to, to scale this for, for industrial applications for our linear source. How do you deal with like, the addition of uh, carbon on different uh, surfaces? On, on ours, sozusagen, on, in, the, in the chamber. No, we, we know uh, carbon sticks very well to plastics, and we have some, some cold coating anyway, so we can coat plastics very well. But if you have metals, then you have to use some, some adhesion layer in between. Something which has some good connection to the, to the steel, for example, which is chromium, and also carbon and chromium are work very well together because they are forming nitrides, and so chromium is a very good interlayer for this. And we got very good adhesion and no problem at all in this case. Yeah, well, there's a question regarding uh, adhesion. But now, uh, if you look at the imaging uh, measurement system, since you have uh, carbon uh, measuring on top of plasma, so to speak, I suppose it's weird sometimes uh, in your environment. And do you see like some issues with the position of other materials on the uh, inside the ECB system? Is that mm -hmm. an issue also? Mm -hmm. we, we don't have looked at the inside, we sent it back. To the, to the colleagues and they sent it back to us and said there's no problem at all, everything is still conductive. But yes, if you have high ionized carbon, then you have some non-conductive films generating and you need only a few nanometers and then you have no connection anymore. But this was not a problem. What we see, we have our orifice, we use a small one, uh, at least I assume 50 micrometers, if it's small or not, this is something you know better. And we have to grind this all the time because we get thick coating on, on the nozzle and the, on the orifice, also at short measuring times. 
we're only measuring for, for two or three hours or so ah. between cleaning. Just like curiously, we have like a plasma exposure time for the overstretch of like two or three hours. Yeah. You, and you see that the signal is going down and you have to do some initial measurement, then do your real measurements and then you have to re uh, repeat the one you did in the beginning and see if it's still the same, if you have still the same transmission through the orifice through the to the device. No, we we, uh, we do it by, by some adhesive tape, only clean up afterwards. This is working fine. Yes. Now we we know it, of course, what we have in the in the cathodes initially, which is five atomic percent, and then in the coatings for boron we have exactly the same, independent if it's filtered or non-filtered, and for molybdenum we have some some changing in ratio. Mostly we have some more molybdenum in the coating than it was originally in the cathode, but up to ten percent, maybe seven to ten, it's the highest. It does. Yes, of course you have the heavy molybdenum. You expect some changes if you shoot the molybdenum deep inside the, the carbon. Then you have some some sp2 rich traces or graphenic traces inside the material, which makes totally different properties. And we did EDX measurements of it. It's working good. Mm -hmm. Then it's, it's getting more difficult, of course. We also did, or not we, another front of institute in the project did XPS measurements of it, do some, some sputter deep scan and seeing what's the contribution or the distribution of the single elements within the coding depth. And so we see also we have not the, the highest amount of molybdenum on the surface. It's 20, 30 nanometers below the surface. It's not, it's, it's this small, it's very difficult to measure, of course. With XRD, we don't see anything. That's <laughs> what we expect, of course. No, we haven't looked in it this much to see exactly what we have, some nanocrystals of these materials. It's Maybe it's possible by fancy techniques, but we don't have it, and so we don't do it. And if we don't get it by selected air refraction, then we don't want to look any deeper in it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome.